Welcome to this conversation with B'nai B'rith International. I'm CEO Dan Mary Ashen. We appreciate your spending some time with us today. Jewish history has been documented for thousands of years, but rarely with as much detail, precision, and structure as in the Posen Library of Jewish Culture and Civilization. The Posen Library, a comprehensive, ongoing project chronicling Jewish cultural and intellectual contributions across the globe, will be a 10-volume anthology project more than a decade in the making. Released in November 2020, Volume 9, Catastrophe and Rebirth, 1939-1973, covers one of the most tragic and dramatic periods in Jewish history, from the eve of World War II through the aftermath of the Yom Kippur War. With me to explore the latest volume of the Posen Library are the book's editors, Dr. Samuel Casso and Professor David Roskies. Dr. Casso is Charles H. Northam Professor of History at Trinity College in Hartford, Connecticut, and is recognized as one of the world's leading scholars on the Holocaust and the Jews of Poland. His 2007 book, Who Will Write Our History, focusing on the Oinig Shabbos Ringelblum archive, was adapted into a 2018 documentary film of the same title and directed by Roberta Grossman, with whom we also spoke recently. David Roskies is the Saul and Evelyn Henkin Chair of Yiddish Literature and Culture and Professor of Jewish Literature at the Jewish Theological Seminary in New York City, and is an internationally recognized literary scholar, cultural historian, and author in the field of Yiddish literature and the culture of East European Jewry. Dr. Casso, Professor Roskies, we're really pleased to have you, both of you, here with us today. Well, the first question is uh, for each of you, let's talk about the scope of material presented in volume nine of the Posen Library. At 1,088 pages, it covers just 34 years of Jewish history, but there's good reason for that. There's the Holocaust, the establishment of the State of Israel and, and more. Now as editors, uh, what do you and Deborah Dash Moore, the editor in chief of the Posen Library with whom we spoke earlier this year, want readers to take away from this volume, and why did you choose to focus specifically now in 1939 to 1973? And did this concept evolve during your selection period, or were there other reasons for it? Uh, Dr. Casso, why don't you go ahead? Well, it's very easy to answer the question of why we chose to focus on this period, because this is the period that we were assigned. Uh, by the editor-in-chief. Uh, there are 10 volumes in the Posen series, and uh, volume nine deals with 1939 to 1973, and uh, uh, Dave, David and I were assigned to do this. But I think we would have chosen this period had we uh, had our druthers anyway. It's a very dramatic period. It's a very important period. Uh, it includes the uh, greatest uh, disaster in modern Jewish history, as well as recovery of Jewish sovereignty. Uh, it's full of, uh, of uh, trauma. It's also full of uh, excitement and uh, uh, drama. Uh, and what we tried to do in this anthology was to give readers uh, a sense of the uh, variety uh, and the multiplicity of Jewish responses uh, to these important happenings uh, across the globe. Uh, how different Jewish communities uh, reacted to the uh, Holocaust, to the challenge of reinvigorating Jewish life. Uh, Another, I think, very important uh, agenda that we had was to invite the reader uh, to see uh, what genres were important in what communities, why a certain genre, why, why a certain kind of cultural expression uh, was particularly salient and important in one Jewish community and not in another what kinds of Jewish expression traveled around the Jewish world and what kinds of Jewish expression remained confined to the uh, particular society uh, where it originated. Uh, we uh, 
want the reader to uh, eavesdrop on the conversations between Jewish thinkers and Jewish writers that were taking place, uh, ask why certain conversations happened, why certain conversations didn't happen. There's uh, photography, there's painting, there's poetry, there's life writing, a reportage, fiction, uh, and uh, it's up to the reader to really delve into all of this and then come away with some sense of, uh, of uh, uh, patterns uh, of Jewish communication, of uh, Jewish thought, of how Jews as members of a collective or Jews as individuals reacted to the events that happened. Uh, and Professor Roskies, your your view of the of the time frame, and if you would, um, because we're starting in 1939, maybe you can paint a brief picture of the Jewish world uh, on the eve uh, of World War II. What we came to appreciate as we worked on this monumental volume over the course of 16 years was the power of the anthology as a genre itself. What you can convey anthologically uh, that you can't do in any other way. So the time frame uh, is a chronology in and of itself, and you can read this volume. And we structured it in such a way that it can actually be read as a novel. You can begin at the beginning and read it through till the end, obviously not in one sitting, but there is a story to be told in uh, the chronological flow of it. At the end of the day, we decided we had to segregate the years 1939 to 1945 and give it a separate title and call it Catastrophe. But in that chapter, we would encompass the entire globe, both uh, what we call the Jew zone, the area under Nazi uh, occupation in Europe and also briefly in North Africa, uh, and the free zone, Jews in the United Kingdom, in the British Commonwealth, in the United States, in Latin America, in the uh, eastern part of the Soviet Union that had not been conquered. And of course, last but not least, the tiny Yishuv in Palestine. So that is, if we can start just there, uh, the precariousness of the, the, the Jewish project in Palestine, in mandatory Palestine with the white paper, when uh, immigration uh, was suddenly cut off at the most critical moment in, in Jewish time, the difference what happens in the Yishuv in the course of that wartime period is truly remarkable. And the pivotal point we discovered as we tracked our writers and our genres year by year was the year 1943. The low point in all of Jewish history when the final solution was more or less uh, drawing to a close uh, where to be a Jew uh, in, in Europe was almost a, a statistical error. And yet, after uh, the defeat uh, of Rommel at El Alamein in uh, the end of no in November 1942, the Yishuv comes to life. And the leaders of the Zionist movement, not only they, but also young people across uh, the, the political an intellectual spectrum, suddenly wake up to the realization that they may be the only ones left, that the future of the Jewish people might rest on their shoulders alone. And what that did was it not only galvanized uh, people like uh, Ben-Gurion, but it also precipitated a break uh, with the Jewish diaspora. So the very same year uh, that Ben-Gurion takes over as, as the political leadership of the Zionist movement, and it becomes a more activist arm of the movement. Um, the Canaanite movement is established by Yonatan Ratosh, 
that proclaims we are Hebrews and we belong to the Mesopotamian area. Uh, we completely sever all ties with the diaspora. We belong here in the Middle East and we are going to create a Hebrew nation. So you have these two opposite poles uh, developing side by side. So what the uh, anthological form enables us to do is to read the story of the Jews in, in three different ways. I would call it the, the three C's. There's the continuity, there's the contiguity, and, uh, and the cherry picking, <laughs> which is also a C, if you like uh, to, uh, mnemonics. Um, so the story begins in 39 and takes us through VE Day, 1945, which was not the same everywhere. The war ended in different times, but essentially it eventually comes to an end. And then the story picks up again in 1946 and we work geographically. Israel, Europe, diverse diasporas, and the United States. And that was a conscious, both editorial decision uh, and a historical decision, and I would say a literary decision. That is to say, the two bookends are Zion and the new Zion and everything in between. So the story can be read as a, a continual narrative from 39 to 45 and then from 46 to 73. That's one way of reading it. The other way of reading it is to see what strange bedfellows geography, genre, and chronology make. And you see the Jewish world together, back to back, the juxtapositions uh, in a way that it would be impossible uh, to see any other way. Um, can I give you an example? Sure. Okay. So uh, it's fairly random, but this is Deborah Dash Moore talk is an American historian and she uh, singled this out as something totally surprising to her. So I would like to share it uh, with our audience as well. America, the broader topic is uh, thought, politics, and religion. So in a two-year sequence, we have Hannah Arendt's Eichmann in Jerusalem, next to Betty Friedan's The Feminine Mystique, next to Joachim Prince, America Must Not Remain Silent, which is, means not silent about uh, racial injustice. You have Reb Zalman Schechter uh, announcing a new order of B'nai Or, which is the first uh, manifesto of what today would be called either neo-Hasidism or New Age Hasidism. You have Judah Golden writing a masterful essay about Midrash. You have Rabbi Soloveitchik coming out with The Lonely Man of Faith and Gerson D. Cohen uh, speaking about the blessing of assimilation in Jewish history. So that is extraordinary to see the contiguity and the back-to-backness of things happening simultaneously that none of us is trained to see because each of us is trained in a different discipline. I'm a literary historian. Uh, Sam is a, a, a cultural and, and, and bona fide historian. Uh, our histo we had different expertise uh, brought to bear on this, but never, it wasn't until all the pieces were put together that we could see the full complexity and diversity of Jewish life. Let me ask you, um, let me ask you this. This is an immense work, but it also is an immense body of research uh, that went into this. Uh, for example, um, languages and dialects. You, you've, you're, you're covering a large part, covering all of the Jewish world or major parts of the Jewish world. Um, much of this is in, uh, is in English, but much of it 
is not. Um, how, how do you work through that uh, to, to pick and choose uh, what you did for this anthology? Uh, Dr. Casso, would you, would you address that? Yeah, it, it was a uh, real challenge. I mean, thank God between uh, both of us, we, we cover a lot of languages. Uh, and uh, we were also lucky enough to find uh, people who could uh, do research in specific areas, such as, say, uh, the Francophone Jewish literature of uh, North Africa, uh, to uh, find uh, writers and poets that we hadn't heard of uh, beyond our area of expertise, uh, people who could help us with uh, Jewish writers from the Arab world, uh, people who could help us with the uh, Jewish writers from Latin America. And uh, on the basis of the information that we collected, we could then make decisions about uh, what uh, writers, what, what poets uh, would uh, uh, be included uh, in the anthology. So it was a challenge, but I think we were able uh, to deal with it. Yeah, Professor Roskies, um, as you delved into um, original source material, were there any surprises and new uh, discoveries uh, for you that um, you hadn't expected to find, uh, but that um, not only uh, appeared, but clearly made the cut uh, for the book? Everything was surprising, even in areas that we thought we knew and understood. So in the first uh, chapter called Catastrophe, when we began looking at this period anthologically, we saw two parallel worlds. The, what we uh, just referred to before as the Jew zone, uh, as opposed to the free zone. And looking at the two side by side for the very first time, you could see how year by year uh, the awareness of what was going on in Europe was growing and uh, a response developed in, uh, in different places. So uh, 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 you have the whole Jewish world mapped out for you uh, side by side from beginning to end. But there were all kinds of surprises. We did not fully appreciate that there was a parallel drama unfolding, and that is the end of Jewish life in Arab lands. That this was also a central piece of the tragedy. The book, uh, every chapter begins with anthologies. So that was a I think a, a, a very exciting uh, development. Ours is the only volume in the Posen Library that isolates anthologies as a separate genre. And the hidden agenda of that was to place the Posen Library at the pinnacle of uh, the Jewish anthological imagination from, from biblical times until the present. The Posen Library is really a meta uh, anthology. So the very first selection, because we were working by genre and by year, just so happened to be, this was almost happenstance, but it was determined by the anthological genre uh, that we were working with, uh, a collection of Ju uh, Judeo-Arabic proverbs, from the community of Fez. So this was found by um, Nina Lichtenstein, who was our editor in charge of French language sources. And it's in French. Why is it in French? Because the only intellectuals in Morocco in 1940 who would have had the awareness that this was a cultural artifact that had to be rescued before it disappeared forever were people who had already entered into French culture and were part of, uh, were acculturating and part of the modern world. So they could see that this was an endangered 
species. But they could not have known uh, that by 1968, 1970, there wouldn't be a Jewish presence in Arab lands, that this really marked the beginning of the end of Jewish life in uh, Arab lands. So that too became part of uh, our story. But how do you tell that story? And uh, uh, it's, it's actually very difficult to track because the uh, di diaspora from North Africa and from Arab lands ends up in very different places. It goes to uh, Eretz Israel, to, to the land of Israel, but also to France. And that was the next surprise. What happens when French Jewry was transformed by this influx of Moroccan and Tunisian Jews? One of the uh, biggest surprises was the prevalence of women writers. Jewish women from North Africa who, if they had not been exposed to French culture, would never have become poets and novelists. And there are, there's a dozen of them. There are 14 or 15 names, none of whom we had ever heard of before. So they become a uh, part of our story. Uh, I wanna ask you about the, the period of 1939 to 45, which you've delineated, uh, Dr. Casso and, and Professor Roski as a Yiddish scholar. Um, curious to, to delve a little bit into Yiddish writing in that period, 39 uh, to 45. Of course, Yiddish was already in, in the major cities of, of um, Western Europe, but Europe was in the war. And then there was the United States, it was Argentina, it was another um, location where there were a large number of Yiddish speakers. Um, what kind of, of writing was being produced during that period in Yiddish and, and how much of it is, has made its way into this volume? Well, one of the uh, most remarkable uh, uh, issues that one could uh, see in, in this volume uh, is the uh, sheer dynamism and creativity of Yiddish literature, both during the war, in the ghettos, and then after the war. Uh, while the... Uh, uh, most of the speakers of Yiddish were murdered by the Nazis. Uh, and while the future of what might be called Yiddish land was very dire, uh, the fact was that in this period, uh, not only were Yiddish writers still writing, but this will be remembered as one of the most productive and creative periods of Yiddish literature and Yiddish poetry. Uh, in the ghettos uh, and in the camps, uh, you have writers and poets like Avram Sutzkever, like Yitzhak Katz Nelson, like Simcha Bunim Shayevich. Uh, you, you have uh, a, uh, an amazing uh, upsurge of what might be called life writing in the ghettos, the writing of diaries, the writing of reportage in the Ludge ghetto by Joseph Selkovich, in the Warsaw ghetto by Peretz Opachinsky. Uh, until now, very little of this has been uh, translated. One of the, uh, I think, great achievements of our anthology is that we give readers uh, some kind of an introduction, some kind of uh, a, a peek into the uh, sheer scale and the sheer variety of, of, uh, of uh, uh, cultural creativity in World War II, and we encourage them to pursue those writings further. Indeed, in the last few years, some of the most important examples of ghetto writing, such as the reportage of Opachinsky and Zelkovich, uh, have been published in English by Yale University Press. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, more and more of the diaries and the poems written in the ghettos are being translated and are being published. 
Uh, Professor Roski's uh, a comment on, on Yiddish and the period of 39 to 45. Yes, so as I said, there are two parallel universes. One is uh, the Jew zone and the other is the free zone. And so we see the vitality of uh, Yiddish writing uh, in that parallel universe as well. The Soviet Union is a very important locus of Yiddish culture. Uh, Peretz Markish, the greatest uh, Soviet Yiddish poet of the, the wartime period, publishes a major collection of poetry, the cover art of it, of which appears in the visual art section. It's a very arresting uh, cover. The title is Far, uh, Folk und Heimland. And uh, the lettering, inside the lettering, the kuf is a, a hammer and sickle. So uh, even icon iconographically, you can tell right away where this is coming from. But it's not political propaganda. Uh, Soviet Jews, 500,000 strong, uh, were fighting both to avenge the murder of uh, uh, East European Jewry and to protect uh, the homeland. So Peretz Markish emerges in the 1940s as a major national poet. He is lib his Jewish soul is liberated uh, and it, 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 it achieves a, a full uh, um, power in, uh, in this period. But there are also among the 500,000 uh, soldiers fighting in the Red Army, many Yiddish speakers. And uh, they emerge right at the end of the war, just before Stalin closes Yiddish culture down, uh, writing about uh, their wartime experience and most poignantly about their return home to see with their very own eyes uh, the annihilation of Soviet Jewry. So they bear witness as uh, Red Army soldiers coming back, and it's the beginning of Holocaust literature. Of course, America uh, is the second haven of uh, and the major place where uh, Yiddish culture incubates in this period. I.B. Singer emerges after a six year long uh, writer's block as a major literary voice. Gladstein becomes the great uh, poet of, uh, of the Holocaust in, in America. So you have uh, Yiddish culture across the globe um, responding in real time. You talk about visual arts. You comment in your introduction uh, that you do recognize the existence of Jewish art. And I'm going to ask an age old question of you both. Uh, how would you define Jewish art? Uh, is Jewish art only about the Jewish people or is it art by Jews or is it both? And how did you determine who to select within that context for uh, for this volume? Uh, Professor Ka uh, Dr. Casso. Well, uh, we uh, in in our uh, introduction, uh, we basically lay out the question as uh, one that's uh, very very complicated. That uh, that obviously uh, you you uh, there is no hard and fast definition of what Jewish art is and uh, and uh, what it what it isn't uh, we see this on a continuum uh, Jewish a a uh, a whether the uh, writer or the artist is uh, Jewish uh, whether there is Jewish content uh, and there are cases where uh, there might not be uh, uh, explicit Jewish content, but we uh, include it in the anthology because they are uh, expressing concerns that are uh, shared by uh, uh, many Jews at the time. Uh, so, for example, we're including uh, Rogers and Hammerstein, o Oklahoma. We're including uh, Dylan, uh, like a Rolling Stone. You might argue that that's not 
uh, uh, Jewish art, but uh, uh, we're not going to fall into the trap of trying to to uh, to uh, define it. Uh, it's a it's a it's an open subject. It 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 has many uh, implications, many parameters, and I think one of the uh, virtues of our anthology is that we put the burden on the reader to decide for himself or for herself. Yeah, I, I, uh, Professor Roski, I'd be interested in your take on this as well. I know it's it's a question really that I suppose there there is no answer to. It's been asked so many times, and I don't think there's there's really an answer. And including Bob Dylan, um, I get that like a Rolling Stone. I mean, it's also like you know all that's been written, for example, about comic art and uh, Marvel Comics and all that uh, that it represents in terms of the fight against fascism, let's say, what it really means um, uh, during, uh, during the, uh, World War II. Um, what's your take on what constitutes Jewish art? Well, I would say that there are certain forms of art, genres that uh, attract Jews uh, particularly, and we see this uh, very clearly. Photography, the disproportionate number of Jews uh, who become uh, leading uh, photographers, both photojournalists in the Soviet Union and in the United States, but also worldwide, uh, there, there, there has to be a, a Jewish explanation for that. Uh, perhaps it's, it comes from an ideological stance of uh, Jewish artists who have a social conscience and want to document the life of uh, the ordinary person. So obviously that uh, socialism uh, left uh, leftist uh, ideologies play into it, but they have to develop uh, an artistic eye to pick out what is important and turn it into something of a lasting value. So uh, there is a very, in, very rich very rich uh, selection of, of photography, some of which uh, documents Jews, uh, for example, in the Yishuv, in the state of Israel, uh, there's a, a striking image of uh, women refugees on the Patria uh, ship uh, at the in 1939. You see that and immediately you recognize that this is an icon of the Holocaust to come, Jewish refugees on a ship. But there are other pictures of, of kids playing uh, hardball on the streets of, of New York, many urban, uh, many urban uh, photographs because uh, Jewish photographers uh, don't, are not drawn to uh, bucolic landscapes. They want, they're drawn to the city. There's something, there's a synergy going on here uh, of, Right between the eye and uh, the the social conscience uh, of the artist, so uh, that's a very important aspect. And comic book art. Um, <laughs> here's what happened: uh, we came up ag against uh, a problem, and that is humor. We discovered very early on that humor does not translate from one language to another. So what do you do? Jews are overrepresented uh, as uh, stand-up comedians, and uh, we all know that. Where is Jewish humor? So one possibility would have been to, you know, uh, lay it all out, uh, but and, and Lenny Bruce and, and company. I argued that that would privilege America too strongly in a book that had to represent Jews worldwide. So the solution was comic book art, that the way that we would, in the end, uh, convey to the reader how the Jews rose in and uh, were drawn to popular culture and defined, defined American uh, popular culture, created Superman and Batman and, and uh, uh, you know, Will Eisner's characters as, as well. They were the pioneers in this field. And some of it is funny and some of it not so funny. Um, they were once called the funnies, but we now know that comic book art uh, developed into uh, high art as well. 
So I would say that uh, genre here is a very interesting lens into the Jewish imagination. I'd like to move uh, to, um, to pre-state Israel and then Israel post-1948. And what you, what you found out there and what you decided to include um, through all of the various disciplines uh, that, you, uh, that you cover. Uh, Dr. Casso. Well, uh, what, what we include is uh, uh, some, uh, we uh, begin with uh, anthologies that uh, came out in, in uh, uh, pre-state uh, Israel during the, uh, during the uh, Holocaust. Uh, 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 period. Uh, we uh, we include some of the writings of uh, Chaim Chazaz and uh, and uh, Agnon from uh, uh, the period of, of uh, the war. Uh, we uh, then go on to uh, include some of the writings and uh, songs and poetry of the War of Independence. Uh, and then we follow that with the uh, striking shift in emphasis in Israeli literature from a uh, uh, primary obsession with a collective, with a collective project, with collective identity, uh, to more concern with the concerns of the uh, individual, the poetry of Natan Zak, the poetry of uh, Yehuda Amichai. Uh, the uh, writings of uh, uh, writers from, uh, from uh, the Iraqi immigration, from the Moroccan immigration. Uh, so we show how this uh, uh, focus on the collective challenge of winning independence and uh, mobilizing the national discipline and national solidarity uh, to uh, 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 fight back this uh, uh, existential threat. Uh, ben Gurion's hope that the very experience of enjoying statehood and sovereignty would create a new kind of Jew. How this period of hope and focus on the collective and on the state gives way to certain uh, features of uh, questioning, of disillusionment, uh, a, a questioning of the uh, uh, idea that a new Jewish state can be a compensation for 2000 years of diaspora history, a questioning of the idea that uh, uh, immigrants from different parts of the diaspora can be seamlessly absorbed into the new Zionist project without pain and without trauma. Uh, we include in uh, the literature the writings of Israeli women like Ravi Kovic, uh, and uh, we show the uh, increasing diversity, di diversity and creativity of this emerging Israeli society. Professor Roskies, uh, what stereotypes or notions about these years, thirty-nine to seventy-three? Do you do you believe the reader might have? And, and how do you challenge those stereotypes through what you chose to be included in the volume? Well, one stereotype would be uh, the Sabra, the tough, uh, uh, beautiful Sabra who is cut off uh, from the past and uh, lives on a kibbutz and is uh, uh, is a, a fighter and uh, a pioneer. So the complexity of who this new Jew is and how he, he and she came to be uh, is uh, very much uh, uh, um, in evidence. The uh, chapter on Israel begins with a kind of um, how to and why to adopt a Hebrew name. It's actually a brochure that we uh, translated. I must uh, also say that oh, two-thirds of the material that uh, appear 
in the Israel chapter, and this is also true for others, but it's very striking in the Israel chapter, we translate it for the first time. So uh, you're reading things in English that were never uh, available uh, before. Um, and I, I just want to point that out. Another, uh, I suppose the, the main uh, surprise of reading uh, the, the anthology are, comes in the biographies. Every selection is prefaced with a short uh, biographical sketch. And that is a story in and of itself, where these people came from and who they were before they became uh, famous writers. So in, is, in the state of Israel, it's everything is an example of Zionist refashioning. Uh, so you discover that uh, Yehuda Amichai was actually Ludwig Feufer, and Amir Gilboa was Beryl Friedman, and Dan Ben Amotz, the enfant terrible of uh, Israeli culture. Well, his real former name was Moshe Tilimzoger, Tilimzoger, a psalm sayer. Who would ever <laughs> have guessed such a, uh, a, 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 a hidden identity? Uh, Uri Orlev, who writes uh, one of the first works of Holocaust fiction, was Yerzy Orlovsky, uh, the poet Avot Yishurun, was Yechiel Perlmutter, Natan Zach was Harry Zeitelbach. So the drama of uh, Zionist refashioning and the dialectic of it, the complexity of it uh, is uh, really uh, astonishing. You also see the first, uh, the beginnings of uh, what we now call Mizrahi literature, uh, where no sooner do they learn Hebrew than they become poets and playwrights. What is new and striking also is that we never lose sight of uh, religious and uh, liturgical writing. So that even in a section on poetry, where uh, you think it's all going to be uh, lyric, modern lyric poetry, love songs. After all, our period is the birth of Israeli popular song. You also have a uh, religious piyutim written by Yemenite poets in a uh, Hebrew liturgical form that goes back to the 11th century. Well, they're also writing in Hebrew at this very time. So the juxtaposition of old, very old, of classical and ultra-modern, you see this uh, throughout the volume. Just one more note on, uh, on Israel. How much uh, does the Holocaust or how much is infused into writing uh, music, uh, art uh, in Israel. How much of that carries over into the Zionist narrative, which you've just talked about? See it already in the 1940s. So as I mentioned, by 1943, the Yishuv realizes that they will have to carry the burden of the Jewish future on their shoulders. So we have uh, uh, Zalman Shazar uh, writing an essay about the Jewish world in 1943 with extraordinary uh, prescience. He knows uh, what has happened, that the heartland of Jewry has been destroyed. And this tiny yeshuv now will have to carry on as best it, it can. So uh, we have, we included uh, a speech given on a, on a kibbutz in 1943, in fact, uh, where the Hebrew writers, these are writers of the older generation, all of whom were born in Europe, coming together on kibbutz Hulda um, to try to fashion some collective response to the destruction of European Jewry. So that's while the war is still going on. And I should also mention in the visual arts section, you have a recruitment poster uh, for uh, Sam, I think the RAF for what for women and men yeah, going into yes to going into the RAF. 
so it's a British recruitment poster, but uh, the lettering is in Hebrew because uh, young, is, uh, young Jews are, are signing up to fight the Germans the only way they can in the British uh, uh, army. Sam, do you want to add something about a response to the uh, Shoah in Israeli culture? Yes, well, well, uh, we, uh, we uh, see it in uh, the writing, we, we see it with uh, Yuri Tzvi Greenberg, uh, we see it with uh, Henoch Bartov, we see it with uh, Arlev, uh, Dan, Dan Pagis, uh, so there are, there are many different uh, examples uh, from uh, different points of view and in different genres. Uh, Dr. Casso, you cover a lot of ground in uh, the anthology selections from post-war America. Um, in the time we have left, just like, I'd like to talk about that for a moment. Uh, how would you summarize your take on the concerns of American Jewish authors during this time period? From your study of the literature of post-war America, would you say that the authors of the 1960s, 1970s, were part of a line of development or were they people like Philip Roth, let's say, real rebels who radically altered the game plan of Jewish worldviews? I wouldn't say they, they altered the game plan of Jewish world worldviews, but, uh, but here's what I discovered. And for me as an anthologist, it was a real process of discovery. First of all, there was an important surprise that, uh, in post-war America, you see uh, you see so many examples, uh, not of despair, not of depression, uh, not of uh, paralysis as a response to the Holocaust, but a resurgence, you might say, of determination and self-confidence. We American Jews, we have to carry the ball. We American Jews have to assume the responsibility of leading the Jewish people. Uh, Eliot Cohn, when he founds commentary, Salo Barone, the uh, historian, Mordechai Kaplan, uh, Morris, Morris Abram, the founding of Brandeis University, all saying, uh, we have to look for the future and the future is bright. Uh, this uh, free pluralistic society, is not a threat to Judaism, but it is. Uh, it can be a catalyst for an unprecedented era of Jewish revival. And then fast forwarding to the 50s and 60s, and if you look at the writings of uh, Roth and uh, Malamud and uh, and uh, Bello, uh, 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 Paley, many others. What, what one notices uh, about these writers is not any one consistent response to the issues of uh, Jewish identity uh, or, or, uh, or any one characterization of their writings such as ambivalence or rebellion or whatnot. But what I see as most significant is that these writers are writing with real self-confidence, with a with a sense of being at the center of American literature. Uh, they're no longer the outsiders. They're no longer the immigrant writers from the outside looking in that you see in the 20s and uh, the 30s. Uh, they're no longer writing about uh, uh, rather denigrated ethnic uh, communities. They're writing about Jews. Uh, Jews with uh, different registers of Jewish identity, but what all their writings have in common uh, is a is a sense of belonging. We're Americans. We belong here. Uh, we are at the center of American literature. Well, clearly, the uh, tremendous uh, work that you have put in uh, to this volume is, of course, very much for the present. Uh, but you're also assembling this, and you have assembled this, really for the future as well. Uh, so again, and this will be uh, our final question um, for you both. Looking forward, how would you like to see scholars, historians, students make use of Volume 9 of the Posen Library? 
uh, and build on your work. Um, the floor is open. Uh, Professor Roskies, why don't you take it? So uh, let me return to my three C's, continuity, contiguity, and cherry picking. So um, what we haven't yet mentioned is that uh, this entire volume is going online and there will be open access to these sources. And that means that uh, uh, for in perpetuity, people will be able to access uh, these sources uh, uh, day and night, 24 seven. So what that enables people to do is to zero in on any issue that is of interest. So if you are studying orthodoxy, all you have to do is to type in uh, the keywords orthodoxy, and you will call up uh, Soloveitchik and Heschel and uh, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, and you will see uh, what is going on in, in the, uh, the beginnings of the resurgence of orthodoxy uh, in America, not to speak of a key word like rabbis, if you look up rabbi, there will be, I don't know, a, th a thousand different entries. You won't even know where to begin. So anyone who is researching a given topic will have this at their fingertips. It'll be actually much easier to access online than in the book. But uh, we are of the people of the book. And so I would say uh, that the real value of this is to read it chronologically and to see uh, the sweep of uh, the richness and uh, of, of this period, third, the critical period where everything is destroyed and everything is rebuilt. Uh, these sources tell that story in a way that I don't think has ever been told before. And the contiguity, the, uh, the simultaneity, the diversity of voices. America, for example, becomes a haven for uh, uh, Jews from all over the world. The book ends with a poetry uh, with th four poets, uh, two of whom writing in Spanish and one of whom is writing in Polish. And they become American citizens and American poets by virtue of living here. Uh, we normally don't even think about uh, Jewish poetry in America, in Spanish and in Polish, but there you have it. So uh, seeing the religious and the secular, uh, the conservative and the radical, the uh, beginning of young voices, we the last anthology that we include is the Jewish catalog. The <laughs> Jewish catalog came out Luckily for us, in 1973, so that's the end point of the Jewish anthological imagination in our book. It's the beginning of, of the whole uh, youth revival uh, in this country. It's an amazing story. I'm so pleased to hear you say that because we were talking before, we, we share a, a Brandeis background, and I remember the Jewish catalog. In fact, I, it still may be here, and it was must-reading. It was must-reading. Um, and uh, it certainly was a, was a great contribution. I look forward to, to seeing that in the volume. Uh, Dr. Casso, a last word on uh, the, the meaning of this volume. I think uh, we uh, answer that question based on our own experience and our own uh, opinions. And the meaning of this volume for me might be very different uh, uh, for somebody else. But uh, for me, what I take away from this volume is that when all is said and done, uh, what we see here is uh, what uh, Leo Schwartz refer referred to as the beating heart of the Jewish people, that uh, many different ideologies, many different levels of religious observance, many different levels of uh, secular identification, many different genres. Uh, but out of this, you have a sense that there is a Jewish people, 
that uh, there is a culture that is uh, responding to challenges, that's responding to uh, trauma, uh, that's grasping opportunities for renewal and for revival in, in many different places in many different ways. Well, for those looking to learn more about a dramatic period in Jewish history, the book is The Posen Library of Jewish Culture and Civilization, Volume 9, titled Catastrophe and Rebirth, 1939-1973, edited by Dr. Samuel Casso and Professor David Roskies, and is available online from the Yale University Press or wherever you purchase books. Dr. Casso, Professor Roskies, thank you so much for your extraordinary work and for sharing your insights with us today. Thank you and happy Hanukkah. Chag Sameach. Chag Sameach. Afreilich and Hanukkah. Well, many thanks to Dr. Samuel Casso and Professor David Roskies for joining me today to discuss their new volume of the Posen Library, Catastrophe and Rebirth, 1939-1973. And thank you for tuning in to this conversation with B'nai B'rith. If you enjoyed this discussion, make sure you never miss a program by subscribing to the B'nai B'rith YouTube channel, liking us on Facebook, and following us on Twitter. And be sure to visit our website, b'nai to learn more about our important work. See you again soon, everyone. Take care.